Sorry, that was some technical. Okay. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the online presentation of the HKSG Digital Travel Bubble. Today's event is a co-presentation between the substation and Singlet Station as part of Substation's program Sandbox. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Clarissa from the Singlet Station, who will be our lovely host slash moderator for the event. So take it away, Clarissa. She's me. Hi, thank you for the introduction, Marilyn. Hello, and welcome to the launch of the Hong Kong Singapore Digital Travel Bubble, co presented by Singlet Station and the Substation. My name is Carissa Pajura Harjo. I am from Singlet Station, and I will be moderating today's event. We have a jam packed lineup for you today, so we hope you stay tuned. The project paired together eight poets from Hong Kong with eight poets from Singapore to create a digital poetry experience that will transport you between the twin cities. Today, we'll be hearing about the project from the editors, Eddie Tay and Joshua Ip. There'll be readings from some of the poets we have in the feature. With us today, we have Jennifer Wong, Daryl Lim Weitie, Naibe Gascon, Mahin Haider, Ang Shuang, Kit Fan, and Yao Kai Chai. There'll be time for a short Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for the poets or for the editors, please leave them in the comments and we'll get to some of them at the end. All right, let's get started. First up, let's hear from the editors, Eddie Tay and Joshua Ip. Hi, um, I guess I should just Hello. say that I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm Eddie and um, Joshua is here. And I, and I guess this, for me personally, this project, I mean, it's, it's about, you know, both Singapore and Hong Kong. I'm a Singaporean, but I've been, you know, in Hong Kong since the, you know, for more than a decade now, you know, for work. And I guess, you know, for me, Hong Kong and Singapore are always in my mind. They are, they are my two locations that, that, that uh, you know, in, in, my, in the sense of being close to home, right, Hong Kong and Singapore. And I think, you know, well, with the tra travel bubble being cancelled uh, so quickly in November, I think it was, uh, it just felt sudden, it felt as if I've, I've, I've been cut off from Singapore for a while, right? Before that, I feel as if, like, you know, Singapore is always just, you know, three hours away on the plane, you watch a movie, you have two beers, and then you're there, right? So I guess this project is, is uh, you know, came out of this, you know, this this, this sense of uh, feeling, feeling as if I'm, I'm cut off from Singapore. Joshua, yourself, what about you? Well, hearing that from Eddie, I realized that Eddie actually physically is the bubble by himself. The mind of Eddie <laughs> is the Hong Kong Singapore digital travel bubble. Well, yeah, this project just came out of a very random conversation on Facebook between Eddie and me when we were following the, the launch of the initial, I think in November, the, 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 the physical travel bubble. And we we're like, maybe we should like beat them to the, to the, to the launch and like just do a digital one fast. Uh, we didn't turn out to be that fast. We still got it out in about two months. But we did get it out before there was actually a physical travel bubble. So we're quite happy with that. And we were just chatting backstage with all the other writers, who some of whom had like met each other for the first time, about when was the last time they've been to Hong Kong and to Singapore and vice versa. And it just, just felt like, I mean, for some Hong Kongers, Singapore is a memory. And for others, it's a dream because they've never been there. And for some Singaporeans, Hong Kong is a holiday. And for others, it's home. And we just wanted to have those different perspectives of like tourists and tour guide and foreign and local just onto the page. And to create that that idea of a bubble that's something fragile and a bit throw away or blow away, but also because of that fragility, that temporality, it, it's precious and beautiful. And yeah, I, I think that's all that we really have to say. And we really do want to let the poets speak for themselves and, and read some of their beautiful works that have come both from a sense of, of place, of their own favorite place in their own country and city, um, but also a sense of distance, of appreciation of another person's favorite place and favorite country. And yeah, without further ado, I'll hand it back to Carissa to chat more about the poets. All right, thank you, Josh and Eddie, for the wonderful introduction. Um, now let's kick off the readings with our first pair, Jennifer Wong and Daryl Lim Weitie. Jennifer Wong is the author of several collections, including Goldfish and Diary of a Mew Mew Sales Girl. Her latest collection, Hui Jia Letters Home, published by Nine Arches Press, explores the complexities of histories, migration and translation. The poet paired with Jennifer is Daryl Lim Wei Jie. 
Gerald's collections of poetry are A Book of Changes, published by Math Paper Press, and Anything But Human, which will be coming out this year. He is also the co-editor of Food Republic, an anthology of food writing from Singapore. We'll be hearing from Daryl after Jennifer's reading. So without further ado, over to you, Jennifer. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Joshua and Eddie, for um, organizing this event and um, uh, organizing this digital travel bubble. And um, really, I'm glad to see, be um, part of this travel bubble with all the other lovely poets. So um, I have chosen um, to write about Mong Kok um, in Hong Kong uh, for my uh, poems on Hong Kong. And uh, because literally, um, Mong Kok is a place where I frequented a lot um, when I was a child and also when I was, um, you know, uh, even a lot, um, for many decades, I have uh, uh, moved around in Mong Kok for a long time. Um, so basically, I think um, it's a place where um, people of all classes can go and they would really find um, all these shops and activities like local traditions and also um, the, the one of the oldest places, for example, selling sweet vinegar um, for uh, pregnant uh, women, um, like for, for women who have um, given birth, they, they will um, have this kind of uh, traditional vinegar soup and um, local pastry shops and so on. And I think um, it's really important also to think about Mong Kok as a place for young people. Um, it's famous for Sneaker Street and um, it makes me wonder, you know, um, uh, whether uh, what the young people think about uh, Hong Kong or think about Mong Kok and, you know, the things that they love and the things that they um, did there um, during all these years and um, maybe last year or many years ago. So um, I've written this poem and then later I will uh, also read out my poem um, re in response to the place that Daryl chose um, in Singapore. Mong Kok, all crowded corner. The song you will never forget about sweet vinegar, its miraculous properties People will queue for ages for a bowl of ramen, a box of gongso cookies, for the spiciest fish bowls, or sticker cards from Sino Center. You are one of them, wading across an ocean to cross these streets. Know that a red minibus means speed or danger. The old man sells bananas, oranges, and on a seasonal basis, Dragon fruit, Zhou Long Yan, reads the horse racing post for betting tips. No, there's no garden in Fa Yun Street. And round the corner, the trendiest people you can spot, with their cropped t shirts and naive dreams, filling the entire sneaker street. In times of peace, they used to look forward to hot pot dinner gatherings. You are one of them too wading across an ocean, the songs you'll never forget, about sweet vinegar, about anger, or more. Um, and now I will um, move on to the poem that I wrote in response to um, Darrow. Darrow chose um, Kalang River um, in terms of uh, the Singapore location. And because um, I've never really been to that um, riverside, but um, but I thought it's just so uh, dreamlike, like um, I was uh, researching on the history of that place and I find it really fascinating. I will let um, Daryl talk more about the place. Dreaming of Kalang. Kalang, the fowls of Singapore's longest river in my mouth. Kalang on Coleman's map in 1835. Orang Kalang, boat dwellers who once lived in the swamps, such shimmering, failed body of water at night, and the tributaries of other people's love stories. There, the water river temple that I never went, its turquoise and vermilion roof, the incense, the unanswered prayers, and the dragons there, impatient with history, will start growling any minute and spring into life. And in the films you watch, catch glimpses of Kalang, grown more beautiful, 
more irreplaceable and closer than you remember it. Thank you. And now um, we will introduce um, uh, Daryl. Daryl is going to talk a more about his plans. Hi, everyone. Yep, Daryl here. Uh, I'll just give a little background as to the place I chose. So, so, so the place I chose is, is, is the Kalang River. Uh, you can see some pictures there. I chose it because, I mean, this neighborhood has been very significant in my life. Uh, my maternal grandparents and parents have lived there for years. And it's really a site of very early his history and settlement in Singapore. And so my first book of poems, a book of changes, really explores the history of the, of the area. Uh, it's the site of where early nomadic people lived, um, the Orang Kalang. It was the site of Singapore's first gas works, the Kalang gas works. And it was also where the race riots of 1964 began. Uh, and so it was through sort of delving to that history that I found the voice and sort of uh, ability to tell the story of uh, my own family, myself, but also intertwined with the, with the story of with, with the national narrative and sort of complicating that national uh, narrative. Um, and so this little temple is called the Chui Kang Bio, and it's just by the Kalang River. And I'm, it's an area that I still visit often. I have very fond memories of dates by the riverside and sort of drinking wine out of plastic cups by the temple. So I'll first read my, the poem that responding to Kalang, which simply just called Kalang. And I'll go on to Jennifer's place, Mong Kok, uh, which also holds uh, some special meaning for me. Uh, so Kalang, Ambrose Hill, the street lamp and robes, the city god and his boyfriend. Under its sticky gaze, they flow and warp and woof and bark. There is no summer. There are no surprises left, but at least there's no corkage. Entering the river naked, but with socks. The river the same. The us smells like sweet commerce. So that was uh, Kalang. Um, I'll move on now to Jennifer's Mong Kok poem. And I think like a lot of Singaporeans, we do have some strange and spectral connection with Hong Kong and Hong Kong and Singapore often seem like distorted reflections of each other. Uh, and this was even more so for me because of course my, my maternal uh, grandparents and that side of the family are all Cantonese speakers. So there is a real affinity for Hong Kong and I find myself uh, sort of uh, getting along very well with uh, people from Hong Kong. There's a certain similarity in the way we view the world. Uh, and so this poem uh, is based off uh, Jennifer's very lovely photographs of, of, of Mong Kok. Um, and it incorporates some very interesting uh, Cantonese sayings and, and proverbs, which some of you may able, be able to spot if you're conversant in Cantonese. And it really describes a kind of uh, vitality and a bit of absurd uh, uh, sort of commercialism that you find there. So the poem is Mong Kok. Mong Kok. The giant bananas like spiders eye the wife biscuits and their wives. The pig commands. Look at me like caramelized tasu. The duck says, I've waited so long, even my neck is long. The mooncake harbors in its center a deep and ancient curse. The century egg is writing creepy chain emails. Inside the vinegar rests a mildly introverted ghost. A pot of piping telephone porridge boils. The sneakers scream, I am the last stage of imperialism. Bags of goldfish explode in my made up face. At the street corner, I remove my organs and juggle them for loose change. So that is all. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this collaboration between me and Jennifer. And I hope you enjoy the poets which we'll read next. Thank you, Jennifer and Daryl, for sharing your poems. I've actually never known the history of the Kalang River, so thank you for illuminating that. All right, next up is Naive Gascon. Naive has worked as a domestic helper in both Singapore and Hong Kong. She won the first runner up in the Migrant Worker Poetry Competition in 2017, and is also part of the first edition of the Call and Response Anthology published by Math Paper Press. I'll let Naive take it away. Oh, uh, sorry, Naive, you're muted. 
Sorry. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here as part of your tour guide at, at the same time, a traveler. Um, everything is possible virtually. So my favorite place here in Singapore is Arcadia Road. It is a road near where I work and live. Um, I, um, it is uh, very near the, the place where I work and live. So most of the time I choose to walk the dog there, um, especially in the morning. I love how the rain trees gives, gives the place its calming and ambience. And, and when the morning sun like hits the branches and, and the leaves, um, I find it magical and at the same time so still, so serene. It feels like um, an assurance that everything's gonna be all right. Just be still, um, breathe, and enjoy the moment. So, which is what I am trying to convey with my poem. So, um, before I read my poem, let me introduce to you the real tour guide of, of this trip. So, meet Hector. I hope you see him. So, this is our dog. So, come and join us uh, as we walk through Arcadia Road. <clears throat> A dog's errand. First glint of sun wakes the city's circuitry. Her hands leashed to me, with thread together with a sense of duty or escape. Turn left, rain trees, a saber arch to a soldier's wedding. Her eyes wired to crooked branches. She vanishes. I take the lead, investigate. Whoops of morning smells, spiders abandoning webs snout down to twigs and rotting leaves. I raise a leg, mark my districts and bushes. Outside cement trail, broken buses merging with dirt, creepers advancing territories, two birds clawing their meal. Above, a squirrel sprints, charging my muscles. Sunlight marbles leaves, beams through jagged frames of trees. She is entranced deeper into her mind's forest, until she is forced to arrive to an end, the end of the road, a greeting from a friend, or when I drag her to our fate, to a precise place, that precise moment, I defecate. With wilted face, she holds me back, where we began, at the fork where grasses are inviting, a highway bursting in our ears. She throws a last glance to the trees, before we march home and roll over to the next errand of our day. Thank you, hope you enjoyed our trip to Arcadia Road. Now, my partner in Hong Kong, Miss Sophie Ip, chose Sun Yat Sen as <clears throat> her favorite place, um, Sun Yat Sen Memor Memorial Park. For around three years of living in Hong Kong, Sun Yat Sen um, is not knew or has been close to my heart, to me also. Um, um, especially the swimming co complex. Uh, it has been a big part of my journey as uh, when I was still learning on how to swim. And I also have some fun memories with my friends there. Hong Kong in general is a big, um, is a big part of my life. Even before I had set foot on its soil, um, Hong Kong basically sent me and my brother to college, um, built a comfortable house for us to leave. Um, all of that, well, all of that is possible because of, um, of the sacrifices of a certain, a certain woman. And my poem for this place is dedicated to her or to them. Uh, please come and join me as we travel through the life of this woman, or shall I say, a particular group of women, to Sun Yat Sen. Memorial Park for Tessie Gascon, foreign domestic worker in Hong Kong, 2002 2017. I think about my mother, cheerful photographs by statues, lovingly tucked into pages of yellow pad in an envelope stamped, airmail, a solo pose, arms akimbo or huddled with friends on a striped picnic mat and clogging weekly grits. 
then laughter after laughter. Containers brimming with home-cooked pancit and adobo wrapped in crinkly layers of plastic bags. Pre-loved dresses to share, the one that didn't fit her. Dreams saved in worn wallet compartments, a dollar for my school fees, another for my brother's shoes, from the ice cream or donut she refuses to spend on. As friends dissolve to their fated streets, she waits on park benches, staring at light pickled windows. She thinks about her family, the house she is trying to build, a sink hipped with dirty dishes under her, empl her employer's dissecting eyes. My mother packs her lungs with the night's calm before ascending to a home where she churns in shadows, doused every time she flickers to light. She remembers every local child she looked after, the vegetable seller who always gave $5 discounts so she had extra for sugary tea, the secret pot spots they hope class A bags. She remembers every alley of the city. Well, they remember her and the remnants of her laughter drifting from tree to tree, like they remember the father in the statue that rises from the sea. So thank you. I hope you enjoy that. And that is all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Naive, for sharing such a powerful tribute to your mother. And of course, introducing us to our special guest, Hector. <laughs> okay, next up, we'll be hearing from Maheen Haider. When not attending a lecture, Maheen can be found on the cricket pitch or in library stacks. She enjoys discovering quiet spots in Hong Kong, talking about Persian rugs, and reading both good and bad fiction. Over to you, Maheen. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Just wanted to thank the team quickly for giving me a chance to not only explore Singapore through poetry, but also relearn a little bit about Hong Kong. So my chosen location is the Callum Cricket Club in Jordan. It, there it is. It's where I've learned to play cricket, which is the only hobby I've maintained through puberty and graduation. There's also a running joke in my family that I learned to walk there because I spent so much of my childhood at the ground. The reason why I chose this location for poetry was because it represents a part of my identity that is very much divorced from my creative side. I'm pretty much defined by my physical performance at the ground as opposed to the words I use or say. And because it's such a central part of my identity, I wanted to challenge myself to try and bridge that gap between the two aspects. So my poem is that attempt at articulating how this ground and location have bled into my identity and inner self. Now we'll move to actually reading the poem. It's called Self Through Scenery, Ground Zero. This scene of slick, clean green, or running to, running from, I find a creature approaching peace, as much as peace can be an absence, sitting in the mind like open heart surgery, as much as I can spare roots and marvel at their circuitry. Rusty taste in the mouth now, but the landscape stays whole. Stale sweat on my heart now, but the landscape won't flinch at the stench. I am farthest from words when I am here. I am sensation. In the haze of heat, there is only the weight of peace. A wary animal that slinks to me, keeping me mindful of the beats where I normally would speak. I break the rules which normally keep me cognizant. The word cognizant wouldn't dare seek me here. Here for a moment this memory without sound. I walk here, self and other like phantoms that breathe step by step. It is not beauty I walk towards, spitting roots, rusty taste, stale sweat. No, this scene wasn't made with something so kind in mind. I walk towards something uglier, something that demands I become sensation, a vivid expression in the spaces my body would rather keep distant. I am not a child of nature, so I brace for the burden of nurture. This scene of slick, clean green, its yellow hues, stagnant blue, its movements delivered with the touch of lullabies, mumbled phrases, all heart. I have known this stage more wholly than I have known myself. Still, I cannot describe it, only me. When I say this is my favorite place, I stop at slick, clean green. When I say this is my favorite place, at times I cannot recall anything but that slick, clean green. When I say this is my favorite place, I mean, 
a reckoning of self in a home that never sought custody. Understand this, I come here knowing it can hold the worst of me. So that was my poem. Now I'll move to the location in Singapore, which was the rail corridor. The rail corridor is a shared space for biodiversity and greenery, heritage and culture, and is an area where people can engage in recreational activities. Uh, as a person who hasn't seen it, for me, it was as a visual, it was just such an interesting contrast between urban and natural life, or rather the idea of an urban person moving into the natural life. Now I'll read the poem that accompanies that location. Uh, titled Corridor Without End. Eyes ever expanding at a green so warm, and embrace underfoot, as if the earth were ready to cushion your fall. Away from concrete jungles and the clatter of its junctures, towards a blooming metropolis with the promise of a blossoming, the healing of a rupture. Escape an oasis, words that spill free. No tinted lenses now, just yourself in company with the trees. Greenery like a beacon that shoulders your walk through their wires. A corridor leading somewhere, nowhere, anywhere. A path seeking nothing but to inspire. In this journey for a sanctuary, you let yourself loose in a vision unsmudged by human hand. In this journey, you find what you were walking for, a moment worth turning back. So thank you so much. That's it for me. Thank you, Raheen, for sharing your poems. And I, as an urban person, am also hoping to catch a few hours of daylight and take a walk in a park after this. <laughs> um, OK, so next up, let's welcome Ang Shuang. Ang Shuang's work has been published by the Asian American Writers Workshop, The Rumpus, and Tinderbox Poetry Journal. She was a Breakout 8 Writers Prize winner and a finalist for the 2020 Autumn House Press Poetry Contest. Ang Shuang is actually here with me today in the Singlet Station office. So I'm going to shift this over and let her take it away. Okay, hey, hey. Um, so first off, thank you, Eddie and Joshua, for inviting me to this project. It was very, very interesting to be pen pals with someone I've never met before and sharing like pictures and poems together. Um, I'll start off by introducing the location I picked which is actually the balcony of my family's apartment. So we actually live in the east of Singapore, near East Coast Beach, which is where you can see the sea over there. Um, and I actually chose this place because I feel like I have a very complicated relationship with this balcony. First off, because I think that the views are really, really very nice, but I actually don't dare to go onto the balcony because I have a pretty bad fear of heights. So what I like to do is just stand somewhere inside the house and then still look out the balcony. And second, uh, something I explore in my poem is that last year when I came back to Singapore from where I was studying in the United States, I had to serve like my two week stay home notice. And shortly after that, it was um, phase one of Singapore's lockdown. So I actually had nothing but this view to look out to for like about one or two months. So that's something I explore in this poem called Quarantine Blues. After two weeks, I get seasick. My stomach lurching whenever I look at the thin strip of blue outside. From this distance, it looks unmoving. And sitting on this dotted lip, suspended 17 stories above the air, I get the sudden urge to take a knife to this view, to pass it through everything before me, to see if it shreds. Everything below and around me is slowing. This country folding into itself like a lantern beneath a sudden downpour. Sitting here, it seems impossible for this world to be all at once so burdened and so beautiful. A passing cloud disturbs, tosses a stone into still life. What is there to do but lay down my imaginary blade and wait? Yeah, 
Uh, now I'll move on to the location that my partner Emily picked. So uh, she actually chose Discovery Bay Reservoir and I'm going to read like the introduction that she sent over to me about this place. So what Emily says is, I took the two pictures on from the reservoir on one of my regular hikes from my home in Discovery Bay up to the dam, a welcome escape during the time of the pandemic. Its beauty and isolation, stillness, and bursting wildness shocks me each time I am there. I hope one day you get to see it with your own eyes too. So the poem I wrote is titled Dear Emily. Dear Emily, I have never been to a bus stop in what looks like the middle of nowhere, but I have to say completely without exaggeration that the picture you sent has fundamentally altered something inside me. I must confess, I am a city girl with an addiction to cell reception and an aversion to off-map locations. But I just bought some hiking boots with nowhere to wear them to. Today, I got on a bike and rode down a path so bumpy it made my insides quiver. And at the quarry at the end of it, I folded my arms and thought, what about some mountains? I mean, what about a hill with its skirt sewn together by trees? What about a sky unpricked by chrome, a lake without a name? And in the middle of it all, what about a bus stop along a pavement pried apart by weeds and two people waiting for something only rumored to appear? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I love that you addressed the poem to Emily, and I think everybody here can relate to feeling awkward about being pen pals with somebody they have never met. Okay, um, so if you're just tuning in, um, all the audience at home, we will be having a short Q&A session at the end. So feel free to drop your questions for the poets and for the editors in the comments, and we'll be getting to some of them at the end. All right, last but not least, the final pair for today's event. It's my pleasure to introduce Yao Kai Chai and Kit Fan. Kit Fan's second poetry collection, As Slow As Possible, was a Poetry Society recommendation and the Irish Times Book of the Year. Diamond Hill, his debut novel about Hong Kong, will be published by Little, Brown, and World Editions in May 2021. Kit was paired with Yao Kai Chai. Kai Chai has three poetry collections, one to the Dark Tower Comes, Pretend I'm Not Here, and Secret Manta. He's co-editor of Quarterly Literary Review Singapore, and he was festival director of Singapore Writers Festival from 2015 to 2018. We'll be hearing from Kai Chai after Kit's reading. Over to you, Kit. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Eddie and Joshua, for organizing, organizing this wonderful tour. And thanks for all the poets participating in it. Um, I have great fun. I often think that um, in all travels, in a way, the mind travels first to a place before the body comes along. So I think this is a great tour uh, for all of us. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a poem called The Spotless Mind. And they, it's taken from some of the photographs I took uh, in November 2019, uh, in this beach in Hong Kong called Pui O on Lantau Island. Um, I was there in November 2019 briefly. Um, as, <clears throat> as you know, that <clears throat> November 2019 was a very turbulent time, month, and, and the turbulence continued in Hong Kong for quite a while. Um, during my visit in Hong Kong, I just really wanted to go back to Pui O again. I went there several times uh, in my life, um, often for no reason at all, partly because it's so unlike the Hong Kong that I was brought up in. Um, it's very quite remote, but it's also deeply Hong Kong in a way that we have to see all around us and we have a sense of the past of Hong Kong being a fishing village. Um, so there it is. Um, the spotless 
mind. After months of smoke and chasing, after absorbing the errors and partitions, I want to see the sun setting irresponsibly on Lantau Island, suffering the outgoing waves too quick for the sand to grasp as they swell and retreat, regulating the pulse like the peaks and troughs of the mountainous backdrop, darkening against the duck yolk yellow that burns away my retinas, so I can see my home blind, undivided, back in time to the re-undiscovered fishing village, where the sea foam covers my feet, withholding what can and can't be changed while I keep returning here to pick shells and kick the ocean for answers. And in these final moments of the thin light dismantling the day, nine water buffaloes, abandoned farm hands of rice labor, stroll childishly along the edge to clean their hoops and replenish lost salt waiting for the heat to drop. And suddenly, I smell the old ink brushing past my neck, thickening the sky into a spotless void. And I shiver. When I saw Makache send, send some photographs of her, well, of his, uh, part of his kind of world in Singapore. And when I saw those photographs, I uh, think he told me that they are called Royal Deck. Um, and I was very haunted by it because uh, those images feel very familiar to me because I was also brought up in Hong Kong and we have, we have similar spaces in the, in the estate where I, I was brought up in, but we never had a name for those spaces. So I was very excited to know that um, those areas are called the Royal Deck. Um, and you will see later on in Kachai's photographs that um, there's a very sweet cat called uh, Kachai called Ginger. Um, I was very taken by Ginger, partly because uh, we had a cat, uh, um, but he died last year uh, due to old age. So um, the photographs for me were so full of haunting. So therefore, I wrote this poem called royal deck of many things. Some nights the wind leaves minor lesions in the air, but nothing happens. Everywhere is clean. The moon swept away. Overhead many encased in concrete blocks. Instant noodling, instant lovemaking. The covered walkways mock the sun and fluorescent ghosts. Even the shadows too thin to cast shapes on the royal deck. I, too, had dark corners and flirted with heights, dangling one leg from the 25th floor, plain windows and graffiti. Many things that could have happened, happened repeatedly somewhere else. As the cat you call Ginger suddenly stops licking, turns west and stares at the void, as if alive removed had returned to Singapore, to this bleached night spot, where not seeing what I should have seen makes nothing happen. Thank you. So I'm going to pass the floor to Kachai. Okay. Um, well, 
thank you very much with Josh and uh, Abby for, for inviting me. Um, when they asked me to choose, you know, choose a location, I, I couldn't figure out where, what to choose. And I, I thought that the most obvious thing is the place where I mostly go. And I think that's the void deck. And then I think as Kit says, it's, it's a place where it's really quite common even in Hong Kong. And I, I really like the idea of the, the calling a void deck something that is completely the opposite of what it, it, it is. So what, what, what it means to me is that there is a ginger, there's a cat that, that everybody owns, and, but yet it's quite completely oblivious to the, the COVID situation. And I, I think that um, the Void Deck, for all its unexotic, completely unscenic kind of qualities, is actually very fundamental to, to more than 80% of Singapore population. And that's why I chose uh, uh, the boy deck. Um, the poems I'm going to read, um, I call them Wonder Karma, which is kind of a cabinet of curiosities. And I immediately thought of the idea of uh, the, the constraint, the, the fact that we are stuck in these times between movement and restraint, between the invability and the, the imagination, the idea that we can, as poets, write about everything in the world. So when the camera, um, the first one is Ode to Ginger. As if everyone's want, when it comes to the annual audit, what to keep, what to leave out, no one can agree, yes? Is there any or none of this of note as we play yet again a game of sucheru in this four by four, a pull of the proverbial plunger, such anonymous park struck, cleat day in, day out, as muchly on the December morning, windy and threatening to rain, you're propelled to the other corner of the void deck, your universe, past uncomplaining pillars holding up the slack block containing human residence, past untucked wall, a flaky palincis ink with a trace of a soccer ball, a thumbprint, a sole of a shoe, past secretive mailboxes, some flaps shy yet ajar, past uncamped rack with indicted bites chained and deflated. One or two topple at yesterday's demagogues, past someone's sarong blown off its bamboo pole, beached like a dead wave, a shadow cabinet of miners screeching their approval, hopping nearer to pallet strewn like concessions. Then a late afternoon washout means your makeshift cardboard bed near the humming generator is soaked to its core. Sauron still unclaimed, wetter, dater, and blown a stone's throw away from the curb. And you too are drenched, fur plumb like punk spikes, now taking refuge on the steps between ground floor and the second. Thunder rumbling like a horde of unseen invaders. You lied. Move, nonchalant witness, and unaware subject. Ginger, or put your name here, as given by unrelated transients, the swift gerund of an unidentified rodent across the frame, hearing capture in the mantle snap by locking the flipper and disabling the solenoids, irked by a whiff of urine that does not go away, and the episodic gurgling of liquids in serpentine's bites, pipes of birth. And to whom shall this be addressed after the homecoming? What's left? As sleep beckons, you stroll back to a new cardboard bed next to the generator. The latter's softly inserting insistent burr, lullaby or portal. By drawn, you could be fish, minor, human, while sarong, revive, flats, what grim creature about to take flight, free. The next one I'm going to read is um, on Kit's pictures. Immediately, I was uh, attracted by the melancholy quality that I find in, in his photographs. I didn't know that it was a place that uh, he went in November where it was tumultuous, but I could, I could sense a certain kind of um, sadness in the poems, a sense of nostalgia, and I, I, I was very moved by it. And so I didn't know where Puyo is. I, I did my research and I found out there was um, there was a lot of, there were feral cows. There are feral cows on the beach. And one particular cow called Billy, a very beloved one, a very young cow, a bull actually, 
uh, died uh, because it has eaten lots of its um, leftovers by by the picnickers, and I thought it was a, quite a um, apt to do, you know uh, uh, to write a requiem for Billy. So this is Window Karma One, a requiem for Billy. One by one, at ease till the feet and beyond, what you eat, what you leave out, no one knows or cares. Yes. Uncarved from farm and human human ownership, brothers and sisters, you perambulate up and down Creole for decades, province drawn only by feral nose for, for edibles. For such is its charm, this so-called spacetura coined in 1528 by Baldassara Castiglione in the book of Courtier to mean a certain nonchalance so as to conceal all art and make whatever one does or says appear to be without effort and almost without any thought about it. The picture we behold now is something ungoverned, gone to seed, languorously. The orange, the orange corona, burned and burnished, soon dipping behind a few swift Chinese instrups. The waves, everything falls into tremendous shower, dissolving me, as Virginia Woolf describes, lapping on our shore like ASMR. The much needed antidote for city slippers crossing water, fleeing a fog of tear gas, pepper spray, sirens, and now the on off lockdown to descend on an old fishing village on the southern coast of Lantau Island. Get there from nearby Muyo by way of a quick cab, a 10 minute bus trip, or a three hour walk by the Section 12 trail. It's 700 meter beach, perfect not only for bovine grazing, but also for human supplication. For which kid have you ever sought at its far eastern end, near the mouth of a river pouring to, into the ocean? Here at a small Ming dynasty temple dedicated to Ting Hao, the goddess of the sea, represented by a figurine wrapped in a red and gold shawl, surrounded by fake flowers, incense coils, ancient bell and drum, a quadrant with ornate dragon handles. Where I pray for you, Billy. The charming eight-year-old bull will acquire a taste of bread and marshmallows left behind by campers and picnickers only to be found dead in November 2018 with enough plastic in you to fill two rubbish bins. But out of this frame, you frolic to the cows come home, foraging through dumb after dumb, moving under a starry sky, free. Thank you. Thank you, Kai Chai and Kit, for sharing your poems. Um, we'll now be moving on to the Q and A session. So we'll be, be so we'll be bringing everybody back on screen, and I'll be reading out the questions, and we'll just open up the floor to anybody to answer. Um, all right. So I guess while we wait for questions to come in, I have one of my own. Um, my question is, how has this project informed your impressions, perceptions, or understandings of your partner's city? And anybody is just welcome to jump in. Or did you learn anything? Um, it was really great to hear everybody's introductions um, to their partner city and like what they learned. I can start if no one else is. So I haven't been to Singapore. So for me, I've always considered in my head that it's quite similar to Hong Kong or in the same vein, at least. And I had a brief conversation with uh, Dill before writing my poem and he spoke about how whenever he's in Singapore, he feels that same urge of being in an urban environment and wanting to experience a more natural area. And so when, so I kind of related to that. And for me, it was like a reckoning of like, yeah, we are quite similar in having that same exposure and experience of being in an urban environment and wanting to experience a more natural uh, countryside, I guess. Thank you, Mahin. Um, are there any other answers or anybody else want to jump in? If not, I'll move on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think maybe a general point that I was thinking about 
uh, maybe not just related to the exchange between me and Jennifer was, in fact, Naive's poems kind of tipped me off to the fact that, uh, and some comments we had earlier in the back chat about both Singapore and Hong Kong being shaped by migration. And of course, there are lots of domestic workers who go to both Hong Kong and Singapore. And so that sort of, the similarity and distortions I sort of spoke about were sort of re-emphasized by reading the whole, um, all, uh, all the poems that, that were the result of this, co this collaboration. So, so I found that quite, quite fruitful, I think. Well, we often talk about writing travels um, or writing enables us to travel quite a lot. We just, we believe in this sometimes. Uh, but, but when I was, when I was working with Karcha, I, I felt like I was quite, not virtually, quite literally traveling for a while uh, in my writing into a place that um, looks very familiar, but also totally different. Um, and that was in a way, a lot of experiences of travel because you always that's my feeling anyway you always bring your your expectation what what a place like i don't know venice las vegas you you kind of have some idea of these places that you're going so in a way your mind kind of anticipates what you should be seeing but then when you're there um it's it's different but also quite familiar and 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 I very much like that experience, and it feels like poetry has that kind of uncanny power to 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 kind of usher us into those weird, familiar, unfamiliar corners. Well, what, what I really like about uh, everybody's uh, contributions, not just the words, but also the photographs, is the very fact that you chose the words, uh, the places that you like, and. To me, that's far away from a tourist tourist trap, and I I like that personal, completely, uh, no 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 regard to to like shopping and everything. So that's what I'm looking for, and I really really could relate to uh, kids uh, uh, the 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 very melancholy. I don't know whether I'm projecting here, but I really really could feel it, and and I also like the way you connected with Ginger, and I, so I think that's more or less what I got from, from our collaboration, even though I would love for you to take me on a tour of Rio one day. Oh, well, I would love to. But let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, uh, writing the poem about Sun Yat-sen is like traveling back to the past, um, traveling um, uh, the memories of my mother, uh, the experiences of my friends, and my experience. So I kind of miss Hong Kong while writing that. Well, I miss Hong Kong, <laughs> especially Sun Yat Sen. <laughs> yeah. And I also like um, the fact that um, um, all the, yeah, I, I kind of echo Kao Chai's um, point about personal. And the thing is also, especially for Darrow's poem, I feel like um, it just brings me back to think that like, um, if we don't, if we've never been to a place, we we kind of appreciate it in one level, and then um, knowing Darrow's story makes it like, and also the maybe the history, like background, and the like I I wouldn't know that the, about the connection to the race riots, and I feel like so strong like um after knowing that, and you know the beauty and the contrast of it. So I think like what we can see and what we can't see is very powerful in these um, poems. Yeah, I think for me, similar to what like Kai Chai said as well, the last time I went to Hong Kong was when I was very young. I went with my family and we were in a tour group. So the only things I got to see were like the very touristy sites of Hong Kong. So like this project really let me see like a very different side that I, I never knew Hong Kong was like. All right, thank you everybody for answering the questions. Um, for everybody watching this live stream, feel free to drop your questions in the comments. We have a couple minutes left for the Q&A and we'd love to talk about them. Um, while waiting for that, um, and my next question to all of you would be, how has this project evolved or added to your relationship with your chosen location? 
For one, I actually learned a lot about places in my own city, Singapore, by you know reading about all of your favorite places. Um, and I haven't been to Hong Kong, so it was great to get to know about that too. Yeah, but I, I think it's it's also important that you know on the one hand we are talking about Hong Kong and Singapore as actual cities out there for us to experience. On the other hand, your poems are about Hong Kong and Singapore that have been internalized, right? So when we read your poems, it's quite interesting because it's through your language. So we are not only reading Hong, about Hong Kong or reading about Singapore, but we are reading about Hong Kong and Singapore in your mind, you know, the, the, the cities that have been internalized in your mind. And I think that's, that's quite valuable as well. Yeah. Yeah, and also one of the things that I, I really like, the fact that you pair Singapore and Hong Kong because for the longest time, Singapore and Hong Kong have been pitted against each other. I, I don't know why Why is that so. Like, for instance, the, the South China Morning Post, I have colleagues working there, so I'm, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's an issue, that they always pick Singapore versus Hong that Hong Kong has to be the winner or Singapore has to be the loser or that one has to win and the other has to lose. So I always hated that because I, I always think that both of us are similar, but yeah, very different. And and I, I I have friends from Hong Kong, and I when I speak to them, I know them as human beings first, and then you you see differences, but you also see similarities. Yeah. I think in this in this particular in, instance, I was very curious about the subtext. Subtext being the specter of the the the, the protests, uh, all the things that are going on, the politics that are going on, and and I could sense that we were very hesitant. As Singaporeans we were very hesitant to address it very explicitly. Um, so I, I'm just wondering whether the Hong Kong uh, poets can explicate about how the current situation has influenced their writing. I, I certainly would. Um, yeah, like it kind of it's always in the background. Um, all these things that happen, and I think um, I'm sure Kit and many other po poets in um, from Hong Kong they will understand that. You know, you would have written a different poem if these things didn't happen. Well, it's a big, it's a very, very big overshadowing on on all of us, and and it feels like the shadow is darkening. Uh, just when you think that things can't be dark, car, it gets darker and dark. And um, and, I, and I suppose I was probably unconsciously thinking about the sun and the sunset when when I was when I chose well, when. Eddie and Joshua wrote to me and I thought, oh God, what, what am I going to choose? And I just basically look at my the photographs on my phone. Oh, let's see what was there. And then and then suddenly I remembered um, going back to Puyo, uh, looking basically just, it's, I didn't know why I went back there really. Maybe I just want to look at the sun <laughs> um, <laughs> and look at the sunset. And for no obvious reason, really, I don't know what I was looking for. But then um, the place somehow is so charged, and I literally did nothing. We just we drove there, look at the sun, and then we left. <laughs> and 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 in a way, that was very. When I decided to choose the photographs, I thought actually, in a way, the sunset captures the sense of really overshadowing of of the mind um on, on all of us when 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 the place we we feel so intimate of and we were brought up in is changing so drastically um uh it's hard to really put values on it because as i think maheen before we came on online you were talking about people do have different views and people should have different views because um, there should have many voices in a city or in any country, but it's how we find a way to articulate those different views in a way that is uh, not about disharmony, but it's about harmony. But but I suppose it's happening all around the world. It's really really difficult to find harmony. Thank you, Kit, for your comment, and thank you everybody for the wonderful discussion. It is reaching 4 p.m., so it's time for us to wrap up. 
And for everybody watching at home, please check out the Hong Kong Singapore digital travel bubble feature on poetry.sp if you haven't yet. We hope it scratches your travel itch. And if you feel inspired to write your own poems based on what you see on the feature, please tag us at Singlet Station and the substation. We'd love to hear from you. This project was made possible by the substation, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and Singlet Station. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.